Hi, I'm Lowell North. This is John Marshall and Dick Deaver. We'd like to share some of the things we've learned about how to make your sales go faster. John's going to tell us about spinnakers and bloopers. Dick's going to talk about mainsails. And I'm going to handle headsails. We're going to spend the next 50 minutes helping you achieve better boat speed and smoother boat handling. We'll be spending quite a bit of time talking about the controls and adjustments available for shaping your sails. We think it's vital that you have a simple method of marking your controls and the record keeping you need so that you can find the good fast settings again when you need them. Keeping track of controls and adjustments that make your boat fast is really very important. We sail on hundreds of boats each year. It's amazing how few people have the record keeping they need to be able to get back to successful settings when they need them. And we'll show you many of the ways we do that later on in the film. But right now, let's go sailing and take a look at shaping the mainsail and its trim. On all boats, from dinghies to maxi boats, the main is the first sail you hoist and the last sail you drop. On fractional rig boats, from J24s to 12 meters, the mainsail is the most important driving force, a sail that has to be able to provide power all through the wind range. That makes the main the most challenging sail to design, cut, and trim effectively, both on fractional and masthead rigs. The controls for the main are the same on both types of rig, and the main is the perfect sail to illustrate the basic shaping and trimming principles which we will use for all sails. Sail performance is determined by the cross-sectional shape of the sail and by the way we position that shape in the apparent wind. The shape of a sail is controlled by two components, the amount of curvature or draft in the sail and the position of the maximum draft in the sail. The amount of draft is measured as a percentage of the cord length, which is the distance from luff to leech. The position of maximum draft, shown here, is described as a percentage of the cord length. The amount of draft and position of maximum draft are crucial to a sail's performance. Changing them is the basis of shaping the sail for all the different conditions you'll encounter on the race course. The primary means of adjusting the draft of a mainsail is mast bend. By bending the mast, we pull the luff of the sail forward, away from the leech, thereby flattening the sail. Mast bend controls fullness in the upper two-thirds of the sail, and the outhaul serves the same function in the bottom third. Luff tension is the principal means of adjusting draft position. As we tension the luff of the sail, the point of maximum draft moves forward. When we ease luff tension, the draft moves aft. Practical experience has shown that a masthead rig will perform best with the maximum draft about 50% of the way aft. The greatest amount of draft is in the upper middle of the sail, while the bottom remains somewhat flatter. Now we'll go to work on this main, adjusting it for different conditions. The sail shown here is much too full, so we will flatten it for about 15 knots apparent wind. First, the lower part of the sail is too deep, and the lower leech is most likely hooked in, so we take out on the outhaul, bringing the clue to the black band. Now the depth in the lower panels is flatter, but the middle and upper parts of the sail are still too deep. To flatten the top of the sail, we bend the mast. In this case, by tightening the baby stay and easing the running back stay. Now, the overall depths look pretty good, but the draft is too far aft and there are substantial wrinkles coming from the luff. A pull on the Cunningham smooths the luff out and brings the draft a little forward. It looks fast now. Don't overdo the Cunningham, like this. Too tight a luff brings the draft too far forward, increasing backwind and reducing drive. Ease it up and get back to our good-looking main. Now let's adjust the draft for special conditions. First, very full for light air and sloppy water, then flat for a fresh air beat in smooth seas. The full setting looks like this. We have eased the outhaul three inches and the shelf is part way open. The mast is almost straight and the Cunningham is off. This setting develops maximum drive out of a low horsepower breeze. The flat setting requires full outhaul tension plus the use of the flattening reef in the leech. Pulling the flattener partway out gives you additional outhaul control to further flatten the bottom of the sail. Once the overall shape is good for the conditions, the main must be trimmed to maximize the boat's performance. 
The basic rule is to adjust the main sheet so that the leech tension is great enough to make the top batten parallel to the boom. Side up the sail from under the boom, checking the relationship between the top batten and the edge of the boom. This main is under trimmed. The top batten is falling off badly. We say that the sail has too much twist. Trimming in the sheet firms up the leech until the batten comes in line with the boom. Remember that the more we bend the spar, the more sheet we'll need to keep the leech in tension. Leech telltales can be useful in deciding on more precise trim. For moderate air beating, the sheet can be trimmed just to the point that the top leech telltale stalls out and disappears behind the sail. In smooth water, quite a hard leech can be successful, but in sloppy conditions, more twist and a more open leech will be required to maintain attached airflow. The basic function of the traveler is to position the boom athwartships. The normal position, in light and moderate air, is amidships for optimum power and pointing. The traveler car itself may need to be set to weather for the boom to be centered. In fresher winds, a centered boom may increase weather helm too much, so it has to be eased down from the center line. Generally, if the rudder angle increases to beyond five or six degrees, the traveler should be eased to free up the helm. In puffy conditions, the traveler must be tended constantly. When the breeze increases to the point where the boat is consistently healing beyond 26 or 28 degrees with the proper headsail set, the main flattened, and the traveler car off center, the fastest way to get the yacht back on her feet will be to reef the main. With her main reefed, Fast Company has less sail area and a lower center of effort, so healing force is reduced. The sail is flattened as well, so the shape is faster for heavier air sailing. You just saw a reef tucked in from start to finish, but here it is one more time. Let's look carefully at the gear needed to reef this quickly and go slowly through the reefing process. First, ease the sheet till the sail luffs, then lower the halyard to a predetermined mark. Take the time to mark your halyards for each reef point. Next, you need to get the tack snugged down, either with a tack hook or with a luff puller. Be sure that the luff is tight before winching in the clue. If you don't, you could damage the luff tape or slides. Now, the reefing line is winched in and jammed off, freeing the winch for other uses. Note how this reefing hardware pulls the clue back as well as down, keeping good outhaul tension. The last step is to trim the main for beating and to tidy up the sail. When you reef, you should tie in at least the first two points to eliminate windage in the slot between the main and the Genoa. If there's time, it's best to tie up the whole foot. And if you use colored sail stops, you'll avoid ripping the sail by hoisting it again with a stop or two still tied in. Shaking out the reef, especially with a slotted luff, can cause some problems. Outward tension on the foot can pull the luff away from the spar when the sail is being hoisted. So free up the reef clue line first, and be sure that the vang and even the flattening reef are eased as well. Then hoist the halyard. The halyard man must watch the luff feeder to avoid damaging the luff tape or jamming it in the groove. When the wind goes aft, a number of things must be done to the main to change it from a fast beating shape to a fast reaching or running shape. In general, the main needs to be made deeper as the wind moves aft. For tight reaching, we need to set the main just a little fuller than it was for beating. The outhaul is eased slightly and the mast is straightened a bit. This close to the wind, the boom may still have to stay near the center line to avoid luffing this full sail setting. As the wind comes further aft and the boom moves well off the center line, the main can really be bagged out. The outhaul is eased substantially, allowing the foot shelf to open up. The baby stay is released, so the mast can straighten up and the permanent back stay is eased along with it. The Cunningham should be cast off as well and the runner can be used to hold the spar absolutely straight for really light air. Once the main sheet is eased off, the boom vang becomes vital to control leech twist. This hydraulic vang is only one of the many ways to get the job done, but whichever vang you use, 
It has to be easy to adjust under load and easy to release in heavy air. Here's the main, reaching with no vang and excessive twist in the head of the sail. The top flattens out and falls away to leeward, producing very little drive. The boom has to be trimmed in too far to prevent the entire sail from luffing. A common mistake in these conditions is overvanging like this. Too much vang eliminates all the twist and completely closes the leech. The upper telltales are stalled out and the sail is again producing no drive. As you gain experience, you will probably find out that the most frequent error on this point of sail is overvanging. Remember, you want a little more main twist when you are reaching, so add vang only to the point where the upper leech telltale is barely flowing. This trim is a little more open at the head than the going to weather setting we discussed earlier. There, the batten was parallel or even a little closed at the top. When the wind is aft of 90 degrees relative and you have a spinnaker set, it may be impossible to get all the leech telltales flowing because the wind angle is just too far aft to avoid stalling. In that case, use a full shape and the same amount of twist is on a close reach. Disregard the top telltales and simply ease out the sheet enough to keep the luff on edge. Before we leave the main, let's look at correct tacking. This is one of sailing's basic maneuvers, and doing it right can mean a significant improvement in your windward performance. This is a smooth, fast tack. The sails were drawing at every possible moment, and there is a minimum loss in boat speed from one tack to another. Here are the important elements of a race-winning tack. Start with the weather sheet ready on the winch, and make sure the winch is in the right gear. When the helmsman calls ready about, the Genoa trimmer removes the handle and gets set to cast off the sheet. At Helms Ali, everyone else moves to position as the boat starts to head up. As soon as the Genoa begins to luff, the trimmer eases out an arm's length of sheet, then spins the rest of it off the winch as a foredeck hand helps the sail through the fore triangle. The main trimmer moves the traveler to the new tack position as the boom comes across. As the tailor brings in the Genoa sheet, the clue is run aft to help the grinder get the sail in quickly. When the boat starts to accelerate, the main and Genoa trimmers sheet in their sails to help the skipper bring the boat hard on the wind. The real driving power of a modern masthead yacht is in the headsails. Cut for different conditions, they are the specialized sail that keep a boat going to weather at peak efficiency in every breeze. On boats like these, the Genoa is the most important factor in upwind performance, and a fast headsail can easily give a boat a decisive speed advantage. For example, on a 30-foot boat, a gain of only 1% in windward boat speed amounts to an advantage that equals more than one foot of MORC or IOR rating. Again, it's the sailmaker's job to make the fastest sail for the conditions, but it's up to the crew to adjust the shape and trim to the best advantage. As in the main, the total draft and draft position are vitally important to performance, and they are adjustable in a similar fashion. In the Genoa, headstay sag replaces the mast bend of the main as the means of changing the depth of the sail, and halyard tension replaces the Cunningham as the means of tightening the luff in order to change the draft position. As you can see here, a Genoa should have the maximum draft around 40 to 45 percent as a starting point, rather than the 50 to 55 percent that's advisable in a mainsail. Let's go to work on Fast Company's Genoa to get optimum performance to weather. We judge correct halyard tension by looking up the sail at the top speed stripes. Here they tell us that the halyard is not hoisted hard enough. Look at the way the sail comes off the headstay. It's too straight, with almost no curvature at the luff, and that means the draft is too far aft. The horizontal wrinkles along the luff are another obvious clue that the sail has less luff tension than the sailmaker intended. Watch the top stripe as we crank up the halyard. Increasing luff tension moves the maximum draft forward and makes the sail slightly deeper. A smooth curve begins at the headstay and reaches its deepest point about 45% of the way aft. Also, you can see that the wrinkles are gone from the luff. This shape looks good for this moderate wind. 
In stronger air, more luff tension would be required to hold the draft forward. Over-tensioning the halyard is just as inefficient as under-tensioning, and here the crew has applied too much luff tension. The head of the Genoa is deep and almost V-shaped rather than smoothly curved, and strain lines from the head and the tack are visual clues that the sail is being stretched out of shape. Ease the halyard. The Genoa must be made fuller for lighter air or rougher water, just like the main, and it also has to be flattened for heavy air or smooth seas. The most important factor in controlling the amount of draft in the headsails is headstay sag, and sag is controlled by a variety of adjustable backstay tensioning devices. This hydraulic adjuster is typical. When the backstay is eased, the headstay sags, and as a result, the sail becomes fuller. Sailing with a relatively loose backstay is often desirable in order to make the Genoa deep for light air. On the other hand, a very tight backstay reduces sag and flattens the Genoa for stronger winds or very smooth water conditions like these. A skilled sail trimmer adjusts the headstay sag and halyard tension together. When we tighten the headstay, the draft moves aft, so we have to tighten the halyard to move the draft forward again. The basic rule is always adjust halyard and backstay as a unit and always check to see that your headstay and halyard tension are working together to give you the shape you need. In rougher seas like these, a deeper sail with a rounder entry is required to provide more power and make the sail more forgiving and easier to trim. To achieve this shape, the backstay is eased to add depth, but halyard tension is maintained to keep the draft forward. This is a power shape rather than a high pointing shape. Once depth and draft position are set, it is time to get the sheet lead just right. It is imperative that you have a system that lets the leads be adjusted easily and that the entire crew be familiar with its operation. No matter what system you use, everyone should be able to adjust leads. The keys to the best sheet lead positions are the Genoa Luff Telltales. As the helmsman slowly luffs up, all the windward telltales should lift at the same time. If we see them break first near the head, while the lower ones are still streaming, we know that the head is not trimmed hard enough and the lead should be moved forward. Now all the telltales lift together. If the lowest telltales are lifting before the upper ones, then the foot is too deep and the lead should be moved aft. Another clue that the head is too flat is the upper lee side telltale. If it stalls or stops flowing first when the helmsman bears away, move the car aft. Your leads should be tested in smooth water with a good average lead position marked on the deck or on the track and noted in the sail log. A good eye for sail shape is important in Genoa trim, since the telltales don't give the whole story. The foot should have ample curvature to bend around the standing rigging without being excessively deep. The leech should also be checked for overall appearance. Leech twist should match the mainsail profile to give you a uniform slot between the sails. It's hard to be specific about eyeballing these shapes, so you have to learn to see the differences in sail shape and feel the differences they make in your boat's performance. One thing that becomes obvious when looking at the slot between the main and the Genoa is the importance of having inboard and outboard Genoa car positions. The most important point here is that the lead should be moved outboard when the boat becomes overpowered. Here, Fast Company is at the limit of her stability, so she is using her outboard lead with her heavy number one. The main traveler is also off the center line and the main is backwinding a bit to help keep the boat on her feet. At last we come to the most important decision of all, how hard to trim the sheet. In general, harder sheeting will allow higher pointing but with some loss in boat speed. For each wind and sea condition, you must find the correct compromise between pointing and footing. The best guide for reproducing the best sheeting of the Genoa in various conditions is the distance of the sail off the spreaders. Mark the spreaders with tape at 6 and 12 inches for a scale of measurement and use boat speed and relative performance against other boats to judge optimum trim. The Genoa trimmer will adjust the sheet for small gusts or lulls. 
to keep the Genoa a constant distance off the spreaders. The most common error is to over trim the Genoa. An over trim sail has the right shape, it's just sheeted too tightly, so the helmsman has no groove in which to steer. Ease out enough sheet to give the helmsman a comfortable groove and he'll steer better. Over trimming kills your speed, so boat speed is an excellent guide. Know your boat. If you're going slower than normal, try easing out the sheet slightly. If the water is rougher than usual, again, ease the sheet and sail a little lower to get more power and speed. Coordination between the helmsman and the Genoa trimmer is essential. The trimmer should help the helmsman by indicating that he's a little high or a little low and aid in sensing if the boat needs a fuller trim or can stand to point a little higher. If a patch of rough water or a powerboat wake requires that the helmsman foot off, he should tell the trimmer so he can ease the Genoa, then trim in again when the helmsman puts the boat back on the wind. Both the trimmer and the helmsman use the luff telltales as their primary aid in keeping the boat in the groove. When the boat is grooving, the flow of air past both sides of the sail is smooth. The yarn stream aft without fluttering. The lee side telltales seen through the sail window stall. Then you are sailing too low or the sail is over trim. This means the sail is not developing the most lift. You should rarely sail so low or trim so hard that the Genoa stalls. The weather side telltales are much more precise as a trimming and steering aid. They gradually rise in angle as you sail higher, finally fluttering as you pinch too much. There is no single angle that's always correct. Some conditions call for footing with the telltales nearly horizontal, while at other times high pointing is best with the yarns at 30 or even 45 degrees above horizontal. In fresh conditions, too much power in the sail plan is every bit as inefficient as too little, since leeway and hull drag both increase rapidly at high angles of heel. On most boats, 26 to 28 degrees is the maximum heel for efficient beating. To control heel angle in heavy air and still have plenty of forward drive, you need good heavy air headsails properly trimmed. The key to switching Genoas on an offshore boat is a jib changing system that allows the new sail to be set while the old one is still pulling. Changing is easier if the Genoas are in breakaway zipper turtles with the head, tack, and clue available for fast hookups. The tack is placed on the free tack fitting and the head is put through the pre-feeder and into the free groove on the head stay. When the halyard is brought forward, it is the bowman's responsibility to make sure that the halyard is not fouled aloft. At the same time, the cockpit crew has to make sure that the Genoa lead is right for the new sail and that the sheet is ready to go right away. The clue is brought aft and the sheet is shifted to the new sail. When this is done, the new sail is ready to hoist. In this case, we have a leeward hoist. Either side is possible, and the choice will depend on which groove and tack fitting is free. When the luff tension is set to the halyard mark for the new sail, it is sheeted in. The old sheet and halyard are cast off, and the old sail is pulled down. There's an even simpler way to do this, so let's try it again doing a tack change. The first step is to move the weather side Genoa car to the lead position for the new sail. Then take the weather sheet off the old sail and snap it on the new one. Note only the weather sheet is attached. Now the jib is hoisted to the mark and the helmsman tacks the boat. As the boat comes head to wind, the crew drops the old jib while the trimmer trims in the new one. The beauty of this maneuver is that a weather hoist, which is safe and easy, is followed by a weather drop, which is also safe and easy. This is the easiest way to change, especially in sloppy conditions. Once the sail is down, the foredeck gang gets it off the bow and up on the weather rail, where the weight will do some good. There they chase down the luff, pull the foot aft, and flake the leech. 
The sail is folded in thirds and zipped into its turtle. Now it's ready to use again. Aerodynamic theory predicted that in heavy wind, a long luff and short overlap headsail, like this 105% blade, would be a winner. Our practical experience confirms this. The blade barely overlaps the mast, and it's only a foot or two short of the masthead. The short overlap keeps the slot open, even with inboard leads. This means the main traveler can be eased off in the gusts without excessively backwinding the main. At the other end of the wind spectrum are those awful conditions when there just isn't enough wind. Today, the quick way through these times is with a super light Genoa made of a mylar reinforced material. Because of its low stretch properties, today's mylar Genoas can be carried safely over a much wider wind range than its Dacron counterpart. But even the light number one Genoa might be too heavy for true drifting conditions and a change to a super light mylar drifter produces instant results. This three quarter ounce mylar Jenny is easily filled and assures a full efficient shape in a whisper of air. When the wind fares to 40 degrees apparent, the fastest combination of sails is a double head rig. It will remain the fastest until you are able to efficiently fly a spinnaker. The combination of a high clued reacher, usually called a jib top, and a Genoa staysail generates maximum drive while close reaching. The Genoa staysail adds power by filling the area below the jib top and creating a secondary slot effect. The staysail lead must be inboard with the lead angle adjusted laterally depending on the exact wind angle. The staysail must create an even slot between the main and jib top. So it should lead inboard when the main and jib top are well inboard, then move outboard as the wind fares and the jib top and main can be eased. The double head rig can also be the best combination for heavy air reaching at wider wind angles. It should be used when it's too windy to carry a chute in the 70 to 100 degree range. As the wind builds, try reefing the main before changing down to a smaller jib. When the wind moderates, or the course allows, you can hoist a chute outside the double head rig and see if it increases your speed. If not, you can douse the spinnaker with little or no loss of speed or position. Today's triradial spinnakers are the most versatile ever, and correct handling and trim of the chute can make as much difference off the wind as all the intricacies of mainsail and Genoa trim do going to windward. Modern construction has cut stretch down to the point where a good all-purpose triradial can reach to 50 degrees apparent in moderate winds and run very efficiently as well. In fact, a good three-quarter ounce triradial may be all the spinnaker many boats will ever need. Let's take a look at the care and feeding of this all-purpose spinnaker. Most boats over 30 feet long will use double sheets and guys off the wind, enabling them to do dip-pole jibes. The heavier after guy will be led from the clue back to the rail near the point of maximum beam, and the sheet will lead all the way aft to the stern. These lines are rigged before you get out of the harbor, so your chute sets are simple and automatic. First, hoist the pole to a preset level for the next leg of the course. Lower for reaching, higher for broad reaches and runs. Presetting the pole is vital, and on hot boats, the pole heights are marked in colored tape on the mast. The chute will usually be hoisted out of the turtle, under the foot of the Genoa. The guy comes around the headstay, the halyard over the top of the Genoa. Before you hoist, recheck everything for proper leads. Nothing spoils a good set like the sheet led under a lifeline. The set itself is a product of proper preparation and good crew coordination. As the halyard goes up, and it must go up very fast, the sheet is pulled aft right away, while the guy is winched back to set the pole position. Stretching out the foot of the spinnaker as it is hoisted avoids the possibility of an hourglass. The jib is dropped as soon as the halyard is up. Don't wait for the chute to fill before dropping the jib, because the jib itself is preventing the air from getting to the spinnaker. Get the jib down. Once the chute fills, the sheet must be eased to on-edge trim, 
and you're on your way. It's easy and it wins races. Watch these local racers in Southern California. The green and white chute won't get its clue pulled aft and the spinnaker wraps right up. The position looks bleak until the crew under the yellow and black chute wait a while to get the jib down, so their chute never fills. Right behind them, the next boat doesn't get the halyard up. In this close company, a perfect hoist would have meant gaining a place or two at the top mark. Now we'll look at the elements of good spinnaker trim. If you're the sail trimmer, you're responsible for the whole sail. So be in a position to see the whole thing. Get aft when running, stand up in the shrouds when reaching. Call pole trim as well as handling the sheet. You'll need to be on good terms with the helmsman as well as the winch grinder, since the two of them can either make or break your job. In calling pole position relative to the wind, use the attitude of the spinnaker as shown by the center seam or the luff and by the windex at the masthead. The luff should rise vertically from the end of the pole. If the luff or the center seam, whichever is easiest to see, slopes to windward, you should bring the pole aft and square it to the wind. If the luff slopes to leeward, as it does here, then ease the pole forward and ease the sheet to straighten up the chute. A rough guide to pole position is that the pole should be square to the wind on broad reaches and runs, and a bit aft of square on tight reaches. The trimmer is also responsible for pole height, since he is often the only person who can see the tack and clue of the sail. The first step is to get the clues level. Adjust the outboard end of the pole to level the clues. The mast end of the pole should follow at once, keeping the pole itself level. The important thing is that with the pole too low, the upper luff is tightened too much and hooks in. This makes the sail luff prematurely at the head and forces a trimmer to oversheet to avoid a collapse. If the leeward clue is higher than the weather one, then the pole is probably too low. Crank it up and you can see the chute open and start breathing. When the pole is too high, there is insufficient tension on the upper luff and it becomes unstable the other way, actually folding around the chute in extreme cases. Vertical wrinkles in the head of the sail give us another indication that the tack is too high. Lowering the pole to the proper height stabilizes the upper luff, smooths out the head, and lets the chute develop all the power the sail designer intended. Result, you go faster. Your final task is actually trimming the sheet. You must constantly be testing the chute by easing the sheet and seeing how close to the edge it's flying. When the entire luff rolls in slightly, threatening to collapse, trim the sheet slightly. Over trimming is the worst error you can make. For many crews, trouble comes at the jibe mark. Actually, jibing is no more difficult than tacking. The helm is controlled to keep the boat under the spinnaker. The main is controlled to keep it from blanketing the chute or sweeping the decks. And the spinnaker is controlled as the pole changes sides. This is an all-hands job, but with a standard double sheet and guy system, you can jibe under control in almost any conditions. When the helmsman calls ready to jibe, the bowman takes the lazy guy to the pulpit. As the boat bears away, the main starts in, and the pole is tripped off the loaded guy, the bowman snaps the lazy guy into the jaws of the pole and shouts, made. The pole topping lift is taken up, and the new guy is winched in. Get that guy in quickly to bring the tack of the chute to the pole and get the pole up and in position fast. As the new guy is loaded, the old sheet on the weather side is cast off. It's as easy as that. The other maneuver that intimidates some crews is a spinnaker change, but it's actually even easier than jibing. The new chute is set up in the bow pulpit. The tack is attached to a changing line at the stem head and a new sheet is rigged. When everyone is ready, the new sail is hoisted on a second halyard inside the flying spinnaker. We haven't touched that sail yet. The important thing is to keep it flying as we get the new one up. Once the new sail is up and full, the after guy is eased so that the old tack can be tripped out of the shackle. The guy is eased further so that the foredeck man can pull it down to the new sail. It's clipped into the new tack and the changing line tripped free before the new sail is cranked back to the pole. 
It's important that the pole topping lift be hoisted as soon as possible. Now that the new spinnaker is trimmed and flying, the old one is lowered and pulled into the cockpit. Very simple. Now it can be repacked or put into rubber band stops, ready for use right away. Now let's go reaching with the spinnaker. Reaching requires some definite changes in trim technique. With the apparent wind closer than 75 degrees, the pole will be on the headstay. In effect, it's oversquared by about 15 degrees to the apparent wind angle. If the wind is right on the beam, the pole can be pulled back off the headstay about 10 degrees. And as the wind goes aft, the oversquaring will be reduced to zero on broad reaches. This pole trimming technique is a direct result of the development of flatter, closer winded chutes. The pole will also be carried lower as the wind goes forward. As you sail higher and the sheet is trimmed in, the clue comes down and aft along the line of tension of the sheet. If the pole is not lowered enough, the head of the chute can become very unstable, with the top washing out to leeward. As the clue comes down, the pole must be lowered to keep the clues level. But the modern triradial is very close winded, so you'll often find that a very low pole is called for on shy reaches. In many reaching conditions, the spinnaker can be augmented with a tall spinnaker staysail. The tall staysail is about 100 or 110 percent LP with a full hoist and is made of three or four ounce Dacron. It's most effective for reaching with the apparent wind angle between 60 and 100 degrees. Ideal conditions for the staysail are smooth water and moderate air. The staysail should be tacked about a fourth to a third of the way down the foredeck. Because the sail has quite a high clue, the lead must be well aft to provide an even luff all the way up the sail. The most important rule in trimming the staysail is to avoid over trimming. One crew member should play the staysail sheet constantly, watching both the staysail and the spinnaker. The important rule is to let the staysail right out any time the spinnaker trimmer is having trouble. If he's too slow to release the staysail as the chute folds, the chute will fall behind the staysail in the main and will be very hard to fill again. Power reaching is an exhilarating way to win races, if you are well prepared and in control. Otherwise, it usually varies between discouraging and terrifying. Here, Fast Company is flying a mini triradial high aspect spinnaker. In effect, it is a number two chute for heavy winds, and its design is similar to a number two or number three Genoa for heavy winds. Like a blade headsail, it has full length luffs but a reduced head angle, reduced mid girths, and a shorter foot length. This sail adds a whole new dimension to heavy air reaching. Trimming on a heavy air reach takes on some new variations, and this crew does the job really well. The pole is over squared about 10 degrees. On a reach or a broad reach, the danger is that if the pole is too far forward, the boat is much more likely to broach violently to windward. Carrying the pole too far forward is a common error. Here the pole is also quite low, about at the first reef point on the mainsail. Now watch the sails carefully. The spinnaker luff folds in evenly. The staysail is kept on edge, and when the chute collapses, the staysail is cast off right away, letting the spinnaker fill again quickly. The boat is really whistling along here and remaining in control. However, the boat can get to the limit of control in a hurry. So here is a good sequence to remember when your knuckles are turning white. When the boat starts to spin out, release the boom vang right away. This frees the mainsail leech and helps the helmsman get control. It's vital. Keep a man on the vang and dump it first. If the main sheet isn't out, let it go all the way. And if you're flying a staysail, dump it too. By now you may be saved. Note that we depowered the boat from the stern towards the bow, trying to relieve weather helm by reducing sail forces aft, as well as healing moment. You'll also need to ease out the spinnaker, letting out sheet in big jerks. The rudder drag caused by the large helm angle has slowed the boat, so the apparent wind angle is now further aft. If the chute has collapsed as you start to round up, wait for the boat to come back to course before you haul in the sheet. Otherwise, you may just fall over into another brooch. On a heavy air reach, the helmsman can be either the villain or the hero. He must know his boat and anticipate problems by bearing off in the harder gusts. 
A crew member can be a real help keeping a weather eye aft for gusts that may be coming down on the boat. It's a situation where teamwork, confidence, and good equipment will put you far ahead. In the past few years, the blooper has become a basic part of the racing inventory. It adds a small but important increment of speed on running legs when the wind is aft of 130 degrees apparent. Here we see ideal conditions for the blooper. Moderate to fresh wind and not too much sea. Here's how the sail works. The blooper is tacked by a pennant outside the bow pulpit. The halyard for the blooper is rigged outside the spinnaker sheet, so the blooper itself flies completely to leeward. The blooper sheet is led over the boom directly to the stern. To fill the blooper quickly after hoisting, you may have to trim the sheet hard and pull the main boom amidships. Once it starts to fill, ease the blooper sheet out and then ease out the main. Obviously, if your blooper blossoms right out like this, don't move the main boom in at all. The blooper sheet is played like a spinnaker sheet. The object is to keep the luff of the sail on edge and the clue as far forward as possible. Speed depends on keeping the luff right on edge. The common error is to over trim the blooper. Ease the halyard enough to get one fourth to one third of the foot parallel to the water. It's not desirable to ease the halyard until the foot is nearly in the waves. In moderately heavy air, the blooper can also make a real contribution by steadying the boat. Its area to leeward offsets the rolling effect of the spinnaker to windward and makes the boat easier to control, helping keep you aimed down the track. When it's really blowing hard, however, common sense says that adding sail area isn't really the right answer. If it's so windy you're choking down the sheet and the pole, you have a preventer on your boom, and the crew is aft holding the stern in the water, you don't really want a blooper. It exposes too much area, and when the boat does roll out of control, you'll be lucky to recover the luff tapes. A number four Genoa, or a small jib set inside the chute and trimmed hard amidships is the right answer on a screaming run. In heavy air or light, every downwind leg comes to an end. Today, spinnaker takedowns have been simplified by the addition of retriever lines for string takedowns. The retriever line is attached to a reinforced belly button in the middle of the chute, and it runs over the lifelines to the foredeck. As the boat approaches the bottom mark, the jib is hoisted and kept loosely trimmed so it doesn't blanket the spinnaker. As the bow reaches the mark, the halyard is released very rapidly. At the same time, the spinnaker sheet is trimmed in several feet, and the retriever line is pulled in by a man stationed in the foredeck hatch. Another person gathers the chute onto the foredeck and down the hatch, and when about half the chute is on deck, the guy and sheet are cast off so the rest can be brought aboard. Now that's a fast takedown, and it works for a jibe takedown with the pole dropped in advance, as well as for a conventional drop. First, the chute is carried right to the mark, a big speed gain compared to a normal takedown. Next, the halyard is let go. Don't be chicken, flake it out so it won't foul, and then let it go. One of the nicest aspects of the string takedown is that the sail comes in forward, away from the trimmers who can proceed without having a chute tangled in the winches and jib sheet blocks. Now here are a few real life adventures with a string takedown. As you can see, it really works. Every technique that you have seen in this film works well if you think it through and practice it. Put them to work on your boat. We know you'll be happier with your performance. We also know that we've thrown a lot of information at you in the last 50 minutes. You may want to watch the film again at a later date. If some of the things you saw look good enough to try on your own boat, you should talk to your nearest North Law. There are good sailors there who will be happy to help you out. Good luck and smooth sailing to you.